Before the white man came to this great continent, it was inhabited by a stalwart race of people known as Indians. Though they were all brothers under the redskin, the Indians were divided into different tribes, such as the Blackfeet, the Flatheads, the Hotfoots, and of course, the Cleveland Indians. When you see Indians, be careful. And when you don't see Indians, be more careful. You know, we don't dismiss what we read. Why should they dismiss what we tell them? I have no idea what Erie means. Nope. No, I do not know that. I, I, no, I don't know. I don't know, see. Do not know. I don't even, I don't know. No idea. It's a great question. Uh... Uh, I believe Erie got its name from the people, but it was a particular way it got the name for Erie. Uh, is it the Erie's Indians? Nailed it. The Native Americans, I don't like to say Indians, I'm sorry, the indigenous individuals, the cat people. Meow. Uh, they were probably there before the settlers and probably helped the settlers, you know, make use of the lake. Just, just what I'm guessing. I know the Indian tribe, but that's the controversy. I sort of starting uh, the episode off with the simple question of like, what does Erie mean? What does it, like just what does the word mean? And uh, from there, I think, you know, obviously we know that it comes from the Erie Honan, uh, but want to try to get to- But where does Erie Honan come from? Where does Erie Honan come from? How to approach this in a sensitive manner where it doesn't look, or it doesn't result in, in us just making, you know, trauma porn. Yeah. I think by being as transparent as we possibly can be, as being as open to as many voices, it's going to be uncomfortable, but we have to get to that specific level. Like this is still something that is real and painful and challenging and hurtful and damaging. Yeah. And we have to be careful how we we view this. So Mike, what's the takeaway you want to have? I mean, the, the, the biggest problem is that there's so much in there that you can, you can only taps the tip of the iceberg. You it's, know what I want the takeaway to be? I want the takeaway to be people having a more informed conversation. Right. Are you ready for the backlash? Because that's going to happen. I'll, I'll, I'll accept that backlash. I do not anticipate and I do not expect mm. that we are going to get everything right. We, because at the end of the day, we do not know the history. And I think we have to be ready to be wrong. At their height, the Erie Honan likely included an estimated 14,000 members in their confederacy. Today, less than 800 people living in Erie County identify as indigenous to this continent according to data from the United States Census and United Nations. At less than half a percent of the population, this community's presence is a fraction of what it once was in Erie.
right, Miguel. How's it going? I'm doing well. Well, welcome to Pittsburgh. So, diving into it, who were the Ariel Honan? These people were part of a larger group that actually covered a great deal, well, all of Pennsylvania, a huge portion of New York State, a large chunk of Ohio, and across the border in Canada, on the other side of the uh, of the lakes, uh, of the two great lakes, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And it included not only the Erie, but also the neighboring tribes around the Erie's, the Hurons, the Petuns, the Tobacco Nation, the Neutrals uh, in central Pennsylvania, the Susquehannocks. These were all people that spoke related language. And when I say related language, think in terms of uh, the language we speak now, English. English is a Germanic language. So that means like when a person says, uh, sitten Sie in German, you know that they're saying sit down, you know, sit. And, uh, and when they say, kommen Sie her, that's German, you know that they're saying come here. These languages are sister languages. By the same token, the languages of these people that I'm talking about, they were all different languages, but they were related enough so that they felt that kinship with each other. My traditional name is Hoya de Gejas. I am from the Tonawana Seneca Territory Hawk Clan. The Erie's were a, were a unique na nation. Um, they, a lot of times, we, they were considered as younger brethren um, to the Haudenosaunee. So they actually sat under our, under our white route of peace. When the white route of peace is offered, that is a permanent agreement. And so they were able to travel within the territory and stuff as, um, as indigenous families. And it's not just a physical, it's a spiritual. It's, it's um, uh, a religious domain, but it's also cultural. Hi, my name is Dr. Joe Stallman. I'm the director of the Onos Aguende Cultural Center. I'm also an independent scholar. Yeah, so the, the Erie got its name from the Erie Heron or the Kakwa. Uh, these were the, uh, the peoples that were living around the Erie area and along the shores of Lake Erie at the time when the French came down into the Great Lakes. And so coming into the area, the primary people that they noticed were the Erie, and so that's kind of how the name kind of stuck. I'm Dr. Will Meyer. I am assistant professor of anthropology and archaeology at Mercyhurst University. I'm not entirely certain uh, where the, the actual term Erie came from. Often in uh, the, the literature, these people are referred to as the Cat Nation. So in the French literature, uh, the Nation du Chat. Um, and that's uh, apparently uh, because these Native Americans uh, decorated their clothes with the tails of some creatures. Um, and uh, that might be Chat Laveur, which would be the raccoon. So you can imagine raccoon tail coats, uh, or it could have been uh, cougars, uh, so wild cats. Um, and interestingly, not in the Erie language because we don't have recorded examples, but in Seneca, uh, the, the name for a cougar is Han Ace, which means long tail. So maybe their coats had long cougar tails. So when you talk about the Eries and the cat people, um, most indigenous people think, you know, they, it was the, the fisher cat that they were, what they were commonly known for. Um, and, and not the, the puma or the panther and stuff. And these drawings and stuff from the Jesuits. And, you know, they're showing the long teeth and they're showing, you know, these long claws. But they also show, you know, this long fuzzy tail. Um, this is a smaller female. And I mean, she's 38 inches. Um, but I've got, I've got male hides and stuff that, um, you know, that are, well over four foot, and they're a very aggressive animal. Uh, you know, the cat people or the lynx people, uh, you know, I do see that as being uh, closer than maybe the fishers. In our cosmology, we actually have three epics of Haudenosaunee creation. 
The second one is the creation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And within this story of the Confederacy, the peacemaker, he comes from Canada. He comes from the North Shore of Lake Ontario in a stone canoe. And when he comes across, the first place he lands is where Fort Niagara was, and he comes down into the Lewiston area. And there was a neutral village there called uh, Kianuka, which was controlled by a queen by the name of Jinko Sanse, which is translated as Lynx Woman. And she was a notorious arms dealer, and she also uh, provided food and shelter to any warring party. And so when the peacemaker came upon her, he started to have a conversation with her and he realized the role that she played. She played this intermediary between two factioning armies. And he thought that was kind of wrong. And so he told her his mi mission of peace and she's actually credited as being the first convert of hearing his mes message of peace. And so she's been bestowed the name of Peace Queen, the first woman's title. And she is called, her uh, translated name is Lynx Woman, and she's an Erie. While some parts of the tribe moved around the region to key hunting grounds, the Erie Elhonan, like many of their neighbors, were an agricultural people who built permanent homes and villages. The Eries were known for, you know, having a lot of blowguns. Um, and it's, it's funny because people say, oh, well, blow guns were only down south. Well, the Eries were known for using um, a lot of these different types of, like, curare-based uh, plants and stuff, like foxglove. You know, it was, it's been harvested and used for digitalis. And a lot of times what it is, um, it's not quite the poison, but it's, it's used to, to stop the heart. You know, when they stop the heart and they keep that, it doesn't pollute the system. Men typically uh, at the growing season would go out and begin their hunting season again and they would stay gone for as long as six months. And they did have a range that they would travel, they would hunt, uh, they would trade, and they would uh, ensure that diplomacy was still occurring between the nations. And so using the constellations, they would keep track of time and they would try to make it back home by the start of winter. When I was a student in Erie in the 1990s, I was told a story about where Presque Isle came from. But some part of me suspects that there may be a long oral tradition of this story. Uh, and it involves some hunters who were out uh, in a canoe uh, and they had gotten rather far away from the shore and a storm was coming up and the hunters prayed and the creator set down his thumb and that made the Presque Isle Peninsula where they could safely dock uh, and, and weather the storm. It does speak to uh, a system of navigation where you never got very far from shore. You know, when they went hunting, you know, they had the first collapsible tent and they would like they look at these these bent willows um, that were tied together and they could they could come into a place they could set them down and then pull them out and it, you know it would make what they would call a wigwam or or a, a wiki up and then just covered it with hides but then they had their permanent permanent housing and permanent areas we know that the erie uh, were an iroquoian speaking group uh, so this put them together with uh, the, the people that we grew up talking about as the Iroquois, uh, who called themselves the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. The Longhouse was where all the people were brought together. Um, a lot of times, some of these Longhouses were a couple hundred feet long, you know, 60, 80 feet wide. And so as they would go, and they have a lot of different clan and family units or groups that are that are living in there and multiple fires, um, but it was it was the security. Um, it was also to help, um, you know, in raising the children and the offspring. I guess that some of these longhouses were um, pretty extensive. So in anthropology, uh, very early on, uh, one of the most uh, uh, studied areas of human endeavors was this idea of kinship and how do we go about it and why do we go about it. 
And so uh, typically we have three strands of uh, lineal descent. We have matrilineal, which is through the mother's line. We see that with Iroquoian speakers. Uh, most famously, we have Jewish people who are matrilineal. And then we have patrilineal, and that's your typical Western European kind of a descent, you know, through the father's line, taking the father's name. Uh, with the, in the New World, it was a real mix. So, for example, uh, we know that among the Haudenosaunee, um, the clan mothers, the, the women, the eldest women usually from each clan, were making important decisions about what men would be sent um, to council for repre representation, what people would be selected to be faith keepers or holy people. Um, and so, um, you know, we think of the family from a Western point of view um, as being sort of the private space. Uh, but for Iroquoian speakers, uh, all throughout the Northeast, as well as down into the, to the Southeast, the Cherokee are also Iroquoian speakers, we find the family is tightly wound up with the public space of, of civic governance. And so feasibly, if you're traveling east to west, uh, you would look, when you enter a community, if you were allowed to enter a community, you would look for your clan home within that community because that clan is supposed to take care of you. They are your family. So uh, first of all, what I didn't tell you at the beginning, uh, this is an eerie sight. And so when the Seneca moved over here, uh, they're moving on to lands that they recently required during the Beaver Wars because this wasn't technically a Seneca area. This was still Erie, right? And so the Seneca have settled on top of the Erie. But the Seneca are also Erie and the Erie are Seneca. We do have some oral history where we believe that the Erie were nothing more than a, a Western branch of the Erie uh, or of the Seneca, and who we call the Seneca are nothing more than the Eastern branch of the Seneca. And so what we have are just two communities that were starting to kind of split apart. Because if you look at the oral history, the oral history says after the Beaver Wars, the Seneca readopted the Erie back into the Seneca fold. But they were related enough so that they felt that kinship with each other. Unfortunately, that didn't mean that they were always were living in peace. And so unfortunately, that, that there was a certain amount of conflict. For me, I don't like talking about war because war is really seen through a particular lens. And through the West, it is a war of conquest. And it's always uh, rigged as a, a war between good and evil. And we see it in the media in our contemporary times all the time, right? I also know the history of the United States and it does have a history of conquest. If I go back a little further, um, all of this gets sort of complicated by Western ideas about borders and nations. Uh, and so, you know, when we say the Erie were living here, um, this might have been the Erie heartland, but there might have been a number of other people living here at the same time. Some native people who came from the north and some from the west and, and the east and, and up from the south. Ultimately, when Europeans arrive, they really do start to bring a new way of dividing up the landscape. Uh, and, and thinking about how that landscape is, is uh, demarcated. And so uh, borders function very differently in a French or, or uh, English mindset. Uh, and that means frontiers function very differently. After Etienne Brulé became the first European to travel beyond the St. Lawrence River in the early 17th century, Various French Jesuit missionaries spread into the surrounding lands to observe and convert the indigenous peoples. Within their records are some of the few written references to the Erie Alhonan. I don't hold anything against the Jesuits, and actually I use their records a lot. Their records are really helpful. These are people coming into a territory and they're the first ones to make the first effort to really uh, put on paper uh, who they were encountering. The Jesuit fathers who, you know, you depending on how you feel about missionization, um, you might not think that they had good intentions, but quite often I, 
I would be generous and say the Jesuit fathers had good intentions in writing things down. And so they're not necessarily right, but they're not necessarily wrong. They're just making sense out of language and a, and a, a, a diversity of cultural customs happening around them that they're very much strangers to. They're strangers in strange lands, and so they're learning language, they're learning culture, and they're learning everything about the new world around them. And I think it's really remarkable that we still have this record to uh, look at. And so when you talk about preservation, um, is telling the whole story, not just the French story, not just the Indian story, not just the British or the English, you know, telling the whole story, the good, bad, and the ugly. You know, and that's the thing is, is that, you know, we can't whitewash things um, just to cover it all and make it all look nice and clear. I said there was, there was good and bad on both sides, um, you know, from indigenous standpoints and from the French and English. So as we're going through and we're teaching and we're working about preservation, um, we need to tell the full story. A lot of times when Western eyes look at this idea of reincorporating a community back into a larger community, they take kind of like a Roman view of history and military conquest when it's not like that. Because individuals and clans and entire communities have the agency to either uh, join or not. Because of the limited amount of and subjective nature of the Jesuit writings, most of the information about the Ire Elhonen is colored by the assumed destruction of that people through a conflict with the Haudenosaunee at the time of the missionary's arrival. In our communities, war is not a business. It's actually a detriment. And so when I think about uh, the Erie or the Susquehannocks or any, of, any other community that's gone and gone into the past, I don't see these moments as wars of conquest. These are really moments where communities are at the, uh, the last straw where they couldn't find that peaceful path and there's a flare up. And these flare ups are short lived. And what people don't take into account, immediately after these flare-ups, there's a condolence uh, moment where there's reconciliation and reparations in every ceremony. And there's an exchange of peace belts between communities highlighting that moment. And those peace belts are given to representatives who go back home and once a year they would bring out these belts and remind people of their responsibilities as individuals to uphold those treaties. And unfortunately, we've lost a lot of our elders. We've lost a lot of those teachings. Um, <clears throat> some, of it was, some of it was written down, some of it was translated. Um, but a lot of it was, 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 was mouth to mouth. It was, you know, oral history. Oral tradition was the original way in which wisdom and history and advice was imparted from one generation to the other for everybody because the written language is really a relatively new. 5,000 years ago, there was no written language anywhere. Before, you know, And then there was that moment when people started developing the written word. Before that, all information, all wisdom was passed on through oral tradition. We have the same issue with some of our ceremonies and some of our um, things that we do is that we lost some of that translation of, of some of those words and you know where, where it was or even even some of those titles of some of those um, you know those different ceremonies. It's important to use accurate language, especially when you're talking about ethnic groups. It just so happens that first of all, Native Americans are not a monolithic group. They're, from the very beginning, it was all these different tribes with cultures and languages as different from each other. The culture of, say, a, a Northwest Coast indigenous person from Washington State is as different from the culture of the, of the Erie as Chinese is to Irish. Generally in anthropology, 
especially contemporary anthropology, we try to call people what they call themselves. Uh, and, you know, that's just a, a politeness. But students always ask, where did, where did this term Iroquois come from? Um, we know it comes from, uh, our usage comes from the French Iroquois. Uh, and what we think uh, is that this was actually the way that Haudenosaunee people were, re were referred to by the Algonquian speakers who were the closer allies of the French. Um, and throughout history, the relationships between those Algonquian speakers and the Haudenosaunee were not always pleasant relationships. When the French came here and they got into uh, fighting and stuff and they were finding out that, you know, a small band of warriors could take out a whole regiment, um, you know, of their of their uh, their soldiers. And so it started as Iroquois and then the French pluralized it and it became Iroquois. It was an insult. It meant snake. <laughs> it was a word that was used, it's derived from a word that was used by the enemies of the Haudenosaunee, of the Iroquois people, to call them serpent, to call them snake, which was used as an insult. Historically, a Haudenosaunee would have not liked being called Iroquois. Everybody has their own uh, ethnic identity, and if somebody calls you out of your name, out of your the, the word that you prefer, and it, it could even be insulting. Uh, so that's why it's important to how, how, what words you use. Uh, that's my answer to your question. Chronicles was made possible thanks to a community assets grant provided by the Erie County Gaming Revenue Authority, Spring Hill Senior Living, support by the Department of Education, and the generous support of Thomas B. Hagen. This is WQLN.